Hi, I'm Robin Murray and I'm a psychiatrist and a schizophrenia researcher at the Institute of Psychiatry and the Maudsley Hospital in London. That's the Maudsley Hospital you can see behind me. And today I'm going to talk about genetics of schizophrenia and how it needs to be integrated with what we know about the biology of schizophrenia. So for most psychiatric disorders, almost nothing is known about the brain mechanisms which underlie the disorder. So it's appropriate that GWAS studies are carried out on an agnostic basis without any preconceived hypotheses. But this is not the case for schizophrenia. We know that aberrant neurodevelopment is involved in some cases, and we know that almost all acutely ill patients show dopamine dysregulation. So, for example, in 1987, Sean Lewis and I wrote a paper suggesting that schizophrenia might be a neurodevelopmental disorder. And in the same year, Dan Weinberger in the USA independently suggested that the brain changes were developmental. And this proved to be a popular hypothesis. And soon it, schizophrenia became regarded as a neurodevelopmental disorder. And many researchers, particularly basic scientists, still refer, it to, refer to it as a neurodevelopmental disorder. But we've learned that this is not strictly true. It's really an adolescent or adult onset disorder with neurodevelopment risk, neurodevelopmental risk factors. So there are risk factors in a early ch in childhood which may or mo may not lead on to a schizophrenia. We know <coughs> a bit about the development because of birth cohort studies, and this is the Dunedin birth cohort study. And this was uh, carried out, we carried it out in the southern island of New Zealand, the city of Dunedin, which is the most southerly city in uh, the world. And uh, these children were followed up from age one to 26, and they were seen about 10 times over that period. And we were able to compare those who developed schizophrenia, as shown in an interview at 26, with those who remained a uh, non-psychotic. And you can see that those who later developed schizophrenia had overall obstetric complications. As uh, babies, they had more neonatal insults. They were smaller for their gestational age at the time of birth, and they'd been subject to more hypoxia. So it's well known now that uh, obstetric events can increase the risk of schizophrenia. And perhaps not surprisingly, motor and language development in pre-schizophrenic children is not, uh, is not normal. And of course, this is affected not only by obstetric events, but also by genes. But if you look at this slide, the, uh, the, the, the baseline is the general population. And you can see that those uh, who later developed schizophrenia had poorer motor development on the left, they had poorer uh, receptive language, and they had lower IQ. What is the average IQ of a New Zealander? Of course, it's 100, like everywhere else. But New Zealand children who went on to develop schizophrenia, their IQ was an average 95, which is, uh, is very classic. And uh, so you can see that there is some neurodevelopment or abnormality in some of the children who go on to develop schizophrenia. And so here are two children, uh, two boys about uh, age nine, and you can think to yourself, which of these boys shows more, can you see any evidence of abnormal neurodevelopment? And well, I can tell you that uh, the boy on the left first went into a psychiatric hospital when he was 18 and was in and out of psychiatric hospital for the next five decades. And the reason for that is that he became a psychiatrist. So that's actually me on the left-hand side. And uh, on the right-hand side, I had a friend who sadly went on to develop uh, schizophrenia. He wasn't uh, 
uh, he, he, he wasn't grossly deviant and that's the he maybe didn't he maybe didn't have so many friends apart from me and perhaps uh, that's one of the examples of the fact that there are statistically deviant children who develop schizophrenia but you cannot go and pick out certain children and say you for sure are going to develop schizophrenia of course you're now all familiar with the manhattan plot I, of the now over 200 genes or loci on the genome which are different in people with schizophrenia compared with controls and you can take all these uh, little risk alleles and you can add them up and weight them for the effect size and you can develop a polygenic risk score for schizophrenia and now numerous studies have shown that a high polygenic score for schizophrenia is associated with lower IQ in patients and in the general population. But is it developmental or is it degenerative? Well, we have recently done a study looking at this. When professors say we have done a study, they mean somebody else has done the study. And of course, in this case, it was Ada Kapinska and Alicia Ajnakina. And we looked at about 6,000 aging adults and showed that in, the gen in this population, high polygenic risk score for schizophrenia was associated with lower IQ and cognitive deficit, a fairly mild cognitive uh, decrease. I, but what we're also able to show is that we followed this sample up for 10 years and in adult life, the deficit in uh, cognition was static and didn't show any further decline. So it's developmental in origin. And studies like this negate the view still believed by many psychiatrists that there is a genetically determined degenerative component to schizophrenia. This is a very toxic and damaging belief because if you, trans if you believe this and you transmit it to your patients that they're going to have cognitive deterioration and that schizophrenia is a progressive disorder, then it's likely that your view will be fulfilled. It spreads hopelessness. So it's important to get this clear that it isn't a progressive disorder. So we can think that the developmental approach to schizophrenia would say that say, children uh, show early cognitive and motor and social impairments. As they go into their uh, teens, they begin to show anxiety and depression then they get social withdrawal and you, 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 this, by then the cognitive uh, uh, changes are very evident. They have a uh, prodromal uh, symptoms and then they develop psychosis. And uh, the, there are genetic factors impacting on this. There are developmental insults impacting on this and social adversity can play a big role in the childhood of these susceptible individuals. But of course, now we know that schizophrenia is not only polygenic, but there is a, an excess of copy number variations in people with schizophrenia. So about two to 3% of people with schizophrenia have a copy number variation. And these copy number variants can also cause learning disability, the same ones, epilepsy and autism. So Mike Owen, Mick Donovan and colleagues, they suggested almost 10 years ago that this supports the neurodevelopmental hypothesis and suggests that there's a continuum of neurodevelopmental impairment from the most severe and learning disability through epilepsy and autism to schizophrenia. Well, as you probably know, or most many of you will know, pathological copy number variants are not found uh, in excess in people with bipolar disorder. And indeed their cognition as children is uh, usually indistinguishable from normal. Here, this is the Dunedin study again, and if you think of the baseline as running along the, the bottom, uh, then they actually show better motor development than the general population, and a tendency to, in this population, to better expressive language, and a tendency non-significant to higher IQ. So schizophrenia is distinguished from bipolar disorder on the basis that it is uh, has a more neurodevelopmental compromise. 
what about the dopamine, onto the dopamine hypothesis. And this was uh, developed really by Arvid Carlson. And uh, he demonstrated that dopamine was a neurotransmitter and then showed the effects of antipsychotics on uh, the dopamine system. And he, I, he, he's now dead, but I heard him uh, about 10 years ago. And he had uh, come to London in 1959 to a major pharma pharmacological conference, very proud of his work on dopamine. And he presented it in 1959. And the chairman of the session was a, a pharmacologist, a very famous pharmacologist called Sir Henry Dale. And he said, well, I'm sorry to say, Dr. Carlson, but this dopamine that you talk of, it's either non-existent or it's a poison. So Carlson was very dismayed and went back to Sweden, but renewed his efforts and he then showed he was correct and, of course, went on to get a Nobel Prize. So drugs that increase synaptic dopamine increase the risk of schizophrenia and drugs that block dopamine decrease positive psychotic symptoms. So the hypothesis in simple terms is that hyperactive dopamine transmission results in positive psychotic symptoms. Here's a little cartoon just showing the formation of, of dopamine from tyrosine to dopa, then to dopamine. The dopamine is released from the presynaptic neuron, goes across the synaptic cleft, cleft and hits the D2 receptor. And we can image these uh, various steps uh, thanks to molecular imaging. And this is the, the European king of uh, molecular imaging, uh, <laughs> Oliver Howes. I say the European king because there's also an American queen over the water, uh, An Anissa Abidargam, who has done wonderful work in this field as well. So antipsychotics act on the D2 receptor. And so at first we focused on the D2 receptor. Was it abnormal in schizophrenia? And this is a meta-analysis uh, showing the, uh, the uh, effects. And in, 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 in fact, they're relatively small. You can see here is the, here, here's the overall effect size, which just uh, gets over the line, the zero line. But many studies do not show increased D2 receptor uh, density, but some studies do. When, so it's not as important as we used to think. But presynaptic dopamine synthesis and release is more important than we originally thought. There's a pretty consistent finding that the syn synthesis of dopamine is greater in schizophrenia than in controls. Here you can see an example. This is work by Samir Johar. And uh, typically, so Samir found that people with schizophrenia had increased a synth synthesis of dopamine compared with controls. So the primary problem in schizophrenia is presynaptic. You can see that there's on the left, too much dopamine is synthesized. It's then released, it goes across the synapse and hits the D2 receptor. Well, in fact, on my slide, it slightly misses the D2 receptor, but it should hit the D2 receptor. And this increased uh, dopamine signaling causes abnormalities in reward learning. It causes abnormalities in uh, salience. So people think all sorts of things are significant uh, when they're really of no consequence. I, and then, of course, what we do is give antipsychotics and they block the dopamine receptor and the, pe the people begin to improve. So going back to genes, remember we talked about uh, GWAS and now, of course, you, many of you will be familiar with this slide as well that there's considerable genetic overlap between psychiatric disorders. So down the left-hand side are the different disorders. Here is schizophrenia, and the darker the blue, the greater the overlap. You can see that schizophrenia genetic, uh, overlaps genetically with ADHD and anorexia nervosa, but particularly with bipolar disorder, which has got the red circle around it. <clears throat> 
So if there is such a, an overlap between the two, uh, schizophrenia and uh, bipolar disorder, maybe 60% of genes are overlapping. What about neurochemistry? And this is uh, Samir Johar again, and this is his work showing in blue that the patients with bipolar disorder they show every bit as much, and perhaps well, every bit as much uh, increased dopamine synthesis as do people with schizophrenia. So this is a fantastic study. This it took him five years to do it because you have to persuade you had to persuade bipolar manic patients to lie in a scanner for up to forty minutes, and he had to persuade the people who were running the scanner that the patient would not destroy the scanner. So it's a, a really a really great uh, study to have done this. So essentially, increased striatal dopamine synthesis is the final common pathway to psychosis. So what about environmental factors? Well, there are now very well established environmental factors. Uh, over the last 20 years, there's been huge progress in elucidating the environmental factors which increase risk of schizophrenia. And uh, these are obstetric events, which double the risk. Childhood adversity trebles the risk. Migration doubles the risk. Being brought up in a city increases your risk. And particularly heavy cannabis use. I, the odds of, uh, if you're using heavy cannabis use, if you're a heavy cannabis user, using high potency cannabis every day, your risk is fourfold or more, maybe more, maybe up to tenfold increase in the risk of psychosis. And also recent, recent events, recent life events show an increased risk as well. So if these are operating to increase the risk of psychosis, do they do this through impacting on synaptic dopamine, on striatal dopamine? And the answer is yes. I don't have time to go into it, but stress, childhood abuse, and migration have all been shown to increase the risk of a striatal, to, sorry, to increase striatal dopamine release. And obstetric events and cannabis use appear to cause D2 receptor sensitivity. So the, ab the dopamine system is abnormal either in terms of the synthesis and release or in terms of the a super of, of super sensitivity. So geneticists fortunately have begun to look at the relationship between a gene susceptibility genes or genes involved in the dopamine system and to see if there's any evidence that these are different in people with schizophrenia. This is a study by Ken Kendler's group showing that uh, they looked at 11 genes involved in dopamine synthesis metabolism and transmission, genes like COMPT or DBH or the DRD, uh, the, the dopamine receptors, etc. They only found evidence for the DR2 locus. But of course, we knew that anyway from the uh, Ripke study in 2014. Increasingly, there are studies looking at pathway analysis. There's a study from the Utrecht group showing are implicating dopaminergic, cholinergic, and glutamatergic systems as having a role in schizophrenia. And of course, I think if you think of the, the study by Kindler and colleagues, they had a very restrictive view. Really, you have to think not only for how, for how is dopamine uh, synthesized and metabolized, but what controls the synthesis. Um, that's GABA and glutamate, and these are the systems which uh, control dopamine neurotransmission. And we know that there are genes for uh, GABA and glutamate amongst the uh, susceptibility uh, genes which have been elucidated. So perhaps the neatest uh, study of uh, looking at the relationship between neurodevelopment, dopamine, uh, function and schizophrenia has come from Maria Rodaki in our department and this is currently in submission but she, I'm showing it with a permission from her and you'll recall that uh, 
individuals who are born with a deletion on chromosome 22Q11 that uh, they grow up to have a very good, well, they have a range of abnormalities, but among that is a 25-fold increased risk of schizophrenia. So a quarter of them will develop a schizophrenia-like illness. And the genes which are knocked out in this deletion are particularly interesting. For example, a, a COMPT, a, which is one of them. A, and a, a, you might think, well, would, if, would this deletion affect the, the, the dopamine synthesis? So what Maria did was to take 21 non-psychotic carriers. These are a, ad, adults. And they have the 22Q deletion, but they're not psychotic. But then that we know that people who have the duplication, so instead of having too little uh, at these uh, sites, they, they have too much genetic material, uh, then they have a diminished risk of developing schizophrenia. So she had 12 non-psychotic carriers of the duplication as opposed to the deletion and she had 26 healthy controls. So what are the results? This is the usual the dopamine synthesis capacity in the striatum. Here are the individuals who are protected from schizophrenia. Here are healthy controls. And here are individuals with the 22Q deletion, the ones who are at risk of schizophrenia. And of course, they have a increased a dopamine synthesis as opposed to decreased in those with the, with the duplication. Now, of course, you'll think to yourself, well, they've got increased dopamine, but they're not psychotic. But we know that when people, before, uh, we know that pe when people are in what we call the prodrome before they develop psychosis, they show increased dopamine, but it gets worse as you become psychotic. And this is what Maria has shown just in one patient who she was able to follow up uh, with 22Q11, who, with, who had the, the deletion uh, and showed an excess of striatal dopamine, but it got worse uh, when uh, she followed up the patient and found that they now had schizophrenia. So let me conclude that uh, we really need to bring together D and G, not Dolce and Gabbana, the fashion designers, but because of course they are already together, but dopamine and genes, and we need to integrate what we know about the genetics of schizophrenia with what we know about its neurodevelopment, its aberrant neurodevelopment, and also the dopaminergic abnormalities which appear to be the final common pathway underlying positive psychotic symptoms. So thank you very much.